Hey, welcome to 12 Tone. In late September 1991, Nirvana released their breakout album Nevermind, propelling them and, with some help from bands like Pearl Jam and Soundgarden, the entire genre of grunge into the mainstream. They had a huge impact on the sound of the early 90s, and to celebrate the 26th anniversary of their most famous album, we're gonna analyze its final single, In Bloom. It starts like this. <laughs> And the first thing to note is that it's all power chords. Power chords are simple chords with just two notes, the root and the fifth. This makes them sound really stable, but they lack a lot of the complexities that give normal chords their unique qualities. It weakens the overall sense of harmony, making it work almost more like a melody. Still though, we can infer some harmonic motion from this, and I have two different explanations for what's going on. The first is based on functional harmony. This is the idea that different chords in a key have different functions or jobs to do, and it applies pretty well here. We start on the one chord, which which generally has what's called tonic function, meaning it's at rest. Then we go to the 6 chord, which also has tonic function. Then it steps down to the 5, which has dominant function, meaning it points you back to the tonic. And finally, we go to the flat 7 chord, which is flexible but can have dominant function too. We're basically just going back and forth between 1 and 5 with some extra substitutions in between. But there's something else going on too, and it's most obvious if we flip the order of the last two chords. Each pair of chords is separated by a minor third. This makes them what are called mediants, or chords whose roots are a third apart, and we're just stringing together a couple different pairs. This is a really common trick in non-functional harmony because mediant chords have a lot in common with each other, so you can imply relationships even without assigned roles. In this intro, the root movement is just alternating between minor thirds and major seconds, which gives it a strong sound even without looking at the jobs they're doing. So which answer is right? Honestly, it's probably a bit of both. The root movement holds it together and the implied functions give it some direction. Either way, we move on to this. And the chords here remind me of a really famous progression called the doo-wop changes but with three differences. First is this chord, which is a half step lower than normal. That's okay though, it just means we're playing a minor version. We're using power chords, so we don't really know the chord qualities, but the melody implies we're in B flat minor, so we'd expect to see a lowered six chord anyway. The next difference is here. G flat is just slightly above E flat, so we'd expect to drop down to it, but instead it jumps all the way up to a higher version. This is again not that shocking. In order to actually play the lower E flat on a standard guitar, Cobain would have had to tune down. Still though, because power chords make the harmony a bit more melodic, this unexpected leap calls attention to that part of the progression. The final difference is this last bar. We'd expect to hear the 5 chord, which has dominant function, pointing back to the tonic, but instead we hear this. And I'll be honest, this one surprised me, because that's a jazz technique. It's called encircling, and it sets up a target note, or in this case, chord. We're trying to get back to B flat, so we start a half step above it with B, then we go to a half step below it, A, and then we just move up to the target. It outlines the B flat before you arrive, and Cobain uses it to give himself a sort of resolution without actually using any dominant function chords. Am I saying Kurt Cobain studied bebop improvisation to help him write this song? Probably not, but either way, the effect is the same. Anyway, then the verse kicks in and the guitar drops out, but the bass keeps playing the same thing, implying the same harmony. Halfway through, the guitar comes back in and something strange happens. Here, check it out. They're all major chords, all of them, but I said we were in minor and the melody seems to agree with me, so what's going on? Well, I could spin some complex web of interconnected scales and modes to help explain this, but I think what's happening is actually pretty straightforward. It's a distorted guitar and distortion amplifies dissonance. That is, if the chord you're playing has any harsh or unstable sounds in it, adding distortion is only gonna make it worse. That's why power chords and distortion go so well together, they have no instabilities to exploit. After the power chord though, probably the most consonant chord is the major triad, so even though a minor triad might be more theoretically correct, Cobain borrows the chords he needs to in order to make it not sound gross. For reference, here's what it'd sound like if he hadn't. <laughs> Yeah, no one wants that. They play through that twice, but the second time, the ending's a bit different. He plays the B chord like normal, but instead of the A, he moves to a D power chord instead. Honestly, this confused me. I spent a long time trying to figure out what a D chord was doing there, until I realized that I shouldn't have been looking at it as a chord at all. It's made up of two notes, D and A, and each of those notes is kinda just doing its own thing. The A is easy to explain. It's encircling the B flat, just like it did before. The D is a little trickier, but I think its main job is foreshadowing. We're heading 
into the chorus which starts out in major and playing a big fat D natural helps prepare that. Plus this section normally moves down and using a D chord lets it move up instead which helps build energy into the chorus. Speaking of which, the chorus is pretty simple. It starts by just moving back and forth between B flat five and G five, and coupled with the prominent D naturals in the melody, we've pretty clearly switched to a major key. These two chords have a mediate relationship and they're both tonic function chords, so this section doesn't really move much. It's happy, but empty, which makes sense with the lyrics about a guy who likes all their pretty songs, but when it comes up that he knows not what they mean, suddenly the chords shift to C and E flat, which have subdominant function meaning they're unstable and directionless, the rhythm becomes more complex, and the melody drops down lower and picks up some D flats, implying a shift back to minor. Combining all these elements makes this section sound much darker than its counterpart, and that juxtaposition is what really sells this chorus. And that's pretty much it. They repeat these sections again, then solo over the verse progression, do the chorus some more, and take us out by playing through the intro a couple more times. This song is really interesting to me because while Cobain never formally studied music theory, the way he used chords here shows that he picked up a lot of the same ideas just by listening. He puts his own spin on them, but they're pretty recognizable if you know what to look for. Anyway, thanks for watching, and thanks to Patreon patron Olivia Anderson for suggesting this song. If you'd like to see your favorite song analyzed, just head on over to Patreon and pledge at any level. You can also check out our store, join our mailing list, like, share, comment, subscribe, and keep on rocking.